Good morning, everyone. Today we are joined by Olivier de Schutter, the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. Yesterday, Mr. de Schutter addressed the Human Rights Council, where he delivered his report. In the report, he calls on states to set up a global fund for social protection, a new international financing mechanism that will help protect populations from the next pandemic. The report and a news release are available online. Mr. De Schutter will briefly review his findings with you now, and then we'll open the floor to any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning to all, and very warm welcome to this um, uh, largely virtual press conference. Um, let me start by saying that um, the COVID-19 pandemic and the economic and social crisis that followed prevent, presents us with a unique opportunity, but also an important responsibility. Um, as a result of the economic crisis, some 115 million more people have fallen to, into extreme poverty in the year 2020. 35 million more may follow in 2021, according to the estimates of the World Bank. And those impacts were not inevitable. They are the result of the fact that we have been caught off guard, unprepared to face this crisis. Of course, in reaction to the crisis, many governments have adopted um, social protection measures, more than 3,000 measures across uh, more than 200 jurisdictions were um, uh, identified by the International Labour Organization. However, um, those measures only um, protected a small fraction of the total population, representing some 18% of the um, total amounts injected in economic recovery plans. And many of these social protection measures were ad hoc, temporary, um, and have been removed or are being removed as the lockdown measures, the sanitary restrictions are being lifted. Um, what we have seen is that the crisis has shown huge gaps in the social protection systems we have, um, and that is true in all countries, although more particularly, of course, in, in low-income countries and developing countries more generally. Why is this? Well, because of high levels of informality in the workforce. Up to 85% of workers in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, are informal workers. Because of weak administrative capacity, making it very difficult to scale up existing social protection programs. And of course, limited fiscal space for poor countries, low-income countries, um, resulting from high levels of debt, from the fall of remittances from migrant workers, from the fall of commodity prices until recently, on which countries depend for their export revenues. And many countries also have a weakly diversified economy uh, so that social protection systems are not adaptive to shocks, whether these shocks are economic, um, pandemic, or climatic, um, they can lead the public revenues to fall at the same time that demand for social protection increases making it very difficult for these countries to maintain an adequate level of protection of the populations. So it is in this context to face these challenges of insufficient fiscal space for countries to invest in social protection and the weak resilience to shocks for many low-income countries that the idea of a global fund for social protection has been put forward. Uh, this is um, not an entirely new idea. In fact, the Social Protection Floor Advisory Group, chaired by Michel Bachelet in 2011 uh, for the International Labour Organization, had identified the need for more international solidarity for the building of social protection floors. When recommendation 202 on social protection floors was adopted by the International Labour Conference in June 2012, there was again a reference to the need for international support uh, to poor countries, allowing them to establish social protection floors. And indeed, target 1A of the um, Sustainable Development Goals under Sustainable Development Goal number one on the eradication of poverty refers to the need for enhanced development cooperation 
in order to provide adequate and predictable means for developing countries to establish social protection floors. But until now, these pledges had not been acted upon by governments. This is now changing. On 19th of June, the International Labour Conference adopted conclusions that asked the ILO to initiate uh, proposals, um, discussions on the establishment of a new international financing facility for the creation of social protection floors. And I look forward to working very closely with the ILO in making this um, mandate um, now a reality and in following upon this uh, uh, mandate given to the ILO. And I would like to, to thank uh, the governments that have um, supported this very important uh, outcome, which is really a historic breakthrough. Um, and in the next few months, we will be working very closely together to make this um, operational. Let me emphasize that the Global Fund for Social Protection that my report describes uh, based on one year of consultations with a large number of governments, international agencies, NGOs, um, should not be seen as a substitute for domestic resource mobilization. Instead, it is an incentive for countries to invest in social protection floors using the domestic resources they may mobilize um, to that effect. And it's a way to strengthen the capacity for these countries um, to expand social protection um, for the benefit of their population, um, compensating for the lack of investment in social protection over the past few years. Social protection flaws are not a cost, they are an investment. Um, the returns are very important um, in um, uh, human capital, allowing a healthier and better qualified workforce um, uh, to, uh, to, to emerge and, and reducing, of course, child labor. Uh, social protection allows economies to be more resilient, allows households to invest more in the education of children, and it has important multiplier effects on the local economy, acting essentially as an economic and social stabilizer in times of crisis. I think what is really also important to emphasize is that more international support to the establishment of social protection floors um, allows countries to move beyond the ad hoc cash transfer systems that they have been putting in place in response to this current crisis. This has been a essentially humanitarian answer until now to the crisis, and we need to move to a rights-based response by the establishment of standing rights-based social protection floors that provide legal entitlements to the population. And this is um, what we can expect from countries if they are provided with predictable support from the international community. And that is what this Global Fund for Social Protection should uh, allow to achieve. Now, the report I presented to the Human Rights Council today that triggered many positive reactions from all regional groups um, builds on a large number of consultations. And I think it was uh, perceived as a very um, a positive development, the establishment of this new facility for two reasons. Firstly, because um, it is based on figures showing that it is affordable um, to establish social protection floors um, because the financing gap for low income countries is, um, is one um, we indeed can, um, can, can meet. The ILO estimates after the COVID-19 pandemic that for low income countries to cover all their population of 711 million people with the full range of social protection floors covering all individuals, um, women, men, and children, from, um, uh, from uh, cradle to grave, um, would cost 78 billion US dollars per year. That is the financing gap. The difference between what low income countries are investing today in social protection and what they would need to invest in order to 
cover all the population effectively in a life cycle perspective. Now, 78 billion US dollars may sound like lots of money, but in fact, it is about half the total um, level of official development assistance provided by OECD countries in the year uh, 2020. And it is 0.3% of uh, the combined gross national income of OECD countries. It is something we can afford. And particularly if the provision of that kind of support is based on the recipient countries presenting national action plans for the establishment and um, expansion of social protection floors, um, uh, allowing the mobilization of domestic um, resources to finance those floors in the future. Indeed, the G7 ministers of finance and the central bankers of the G7 countries in their meeting of 4th and 5th of June have already mentioned one source of funding that could serve to support the Global Fund for Social Protection, and that is the use of special drawing rights of the IMF. The G7 ministers of finance and central bankers um, have indicated that before the end of August, the equivalent of 650 billion US dollars in special drawing rights should support the economic recovery. 21 billion will automatically go to low income countries already and unused SDRs uh, from other countries might um, increase uh, the amount made available to low income countries to finance the recovery. And my suggestion is that a significant part of this uh, uh, a new amount of liquidities should go to establish and expand in time social protection flaws. And finally, the, the last reason why this proposal has met with a, a strong support in the Human Rights Council is that it is not proposing to build a new um, costly bureaucracy. It's not proposing to duplicate existing mechanisms. It's not proposing to, invent, to reinvent the wheel. It is proposing to build on what we already have in order to make the existing mechanisms that work to support social protection floors um, in developing countries to work better, more effectively uh, uh, with one another. We have um, already um, uh, the USP 2030 partnership, bringing together governments, international agencies, NGOs behind the idea of universalization of social protection floors. And this USP 2030 platform could serve as the alliance of governments, international agencies, and civil society groups that can um, govern the future uh, work of the Global Fund for Social Protection. We also have within the International Labour Organization, the ILO flagship program on social protection floors for all that could function as a secretariat for this Global Fund for Social Protection. And we have the United Nations um, multi-trust um, multi fund office that could serve as the executing arm for this Global Fund for Social Protection. In other terms, we already have a number of mechanisms in place that simply need to work together more effectively, that need more support for the work they are already doing in order for the dream of universalization of social protection floors to become a reality. I think this crisis is of course a huge challenge, but it also is a fantastic opportunity. And I believe that it can be a very powerful tool to eradicate poverty and thus to fulfill the pledge of the first sustainable development goal. I'd like to thank you and I look forward to receiving your questions to provide further details perhaps on this proposal. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, a first question from Peter Kenny. Peter? Thank you. My name is Peter Kenny. I work for the Anadilu Agency. I'm just wondering uh, what sort of support do you see the sort of like G7 nations, for instance, who would be uh, critical uh, in something like this, uh, having for uh, such a fund? And uh, is it practical to have the ILO, which is not really a, 
a, a monetary uh, mechanism uh, administering the fund. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll answer directly the, the question of Mr. Kenny, whom I, whom I thank for his questions. Um, I've been in a permanent dialogue with the Italian presidency of the G20 uh, on this issue. I also have uh, established a dialogue with the UK, uh, chairing the, the G7 um, uh, presently, in order to ensure that within those fora, um, support is, is, um, is built uh, for the Global Fund for Social Protection. I think um, gradually um, rich countries in the G7 and uh, the most important um, economies in the G20 realize that social protection deserves much more support than it has been receiving until now. Um, the, the figures we have um, about the, the level of um, commitment to social protection until now um, show that we've been grossly underinvesting in social protection um, in, in the past. Um, uh, the amounts um, um, of uh, uh, money going to social protection are a very small fraction of total official development assistance despite the fact that social protection has very important multiplier effects by allowing to build human capital and by uh, allowing um, uh, the, the demand from consumers to increase um, in order to um, uh, operate as a counter-cyclical mechanism in times of crisis. So I think the G7 and G20 countries can be convinced uh, uh, of uh, uh, supporting this mechanism um, in the future. Um, and I very much hope that under the, the German presidency of the G7 in 2022, um, this mechanism will be put in place. I have uh, proposed that we set as a deadline June 2022, which is the 10th anniversary of Recommendation 202 on social protection floors. Um, that would be a, a, a very um, um, important symbol um, that uh, 10 years after that recommendation was adopted within the ILO, um, we established this new international financial uh, facility. As to the question of the International Labour Organization's role, I, I would like to say that the conclusions adopted by the International Labour Conference, with the very strong support from governments, from unions, and from employers' organizations, shows that the ILO is a trusted partner in um, moving in this direction. Now, of course, the ILO will not do this on its own. It has a very strong um, experience in uh, providing technical advice and building capacity in countries to establish and expand social protection floors. In 26 countries, it has led the process of assessment-based national dialogues to identify what needs to be done to expand social protection floors, and these assessment-based national dialogues should be expanded in the future in the countries seeking to benefit from the support of the Global Fund. But of course, um, other um, um, actors could play a role. And USP 2030, the Partnership on Universal Social Protection, um, is co-led by the World Bank and the ILO, um, that therefore both lend their expertise um, uh, to this process. Um, and I also uh, believe that um, the, um, uh, the, the, the report I presented um, show how different mechanisms uh, that have a strong expertise in the delivery of funds can be mobilized um, in order to give uh, the, social, uh, the, the Global Fund for Social Protection um, all the expertise it, it requires. So the idea is not that the ILO will be the sole actor in this process, but it will have a leading role given its, um, um, its unique uh, expertise in, in advising countries as to how to build social protection floors. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've no more questions. We'll just uh, hold, hold on for uh, 30 seconds or so uh, to see if anyone would like to ask something further. Yes, we have one from uh, Kasmira Jefford. 
Over to you. Uh, thank you. Apologies for the background noise. Can you hear me okay? Um, I, I just, just a really simple question. I just wanted to know really what the next step beyond the report will be at this point to, um, you know, bringing this plan into fruition. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the International Labour Conference, and that is a, a huge victory for all the actors, uh, unions, uh, uh, civil society groups, governments, whom have been meeting over the past year to discuss this proposal. The International Labour Conference has adopted now conclusions that give a very clear mandate to the um, ILO um, to make this fund happen. The ILO, and I quote here from the conclusions adopted, is requested to initiate and engage in discussions on concrete proposals for a new international financing mechanism, such as a global social protection fund, which could complement and support domestic resource mobilization efforts in order to achieve universal social protection. It will happen. And the timeline is that by November um, of this year, the um, ILO should be presented, the ILO governing body should be presented with an action plan to implement the conclusions that were adopted by the International Labour Conference. And this action plan should contain very concrete proposals as to how to put in place this new mechanism. And of course, it then shall have to be approved by the governments, the um, workers and the employers' representatives in the tripartite structure of the ILO. Between now and then, I will be working very closely with the ILO to um, um, uh, develop these operational proposals. The report I'm presenting is the result of um, uh, one year of consultations with a large number of actors in different fora. And therefore, um, I think the general feeling is that it can provide a useful baseline on the basis of which um, discussions may, uh, may start. But of course, um, um, uh, many more um, uh, refinements uh, should be um, made to the proposals uh, before they can um, uh, be formally adopted by the governing body of the ILO. Um, as I stated earlier, I hope that in June 2022, we can move towards um, the operational phase and that the Global Fund for Social Protection, building on the existing mechanisms we have, will become um, a reality. It's hugely important. Uh, today, um, no less than 55% of the world's population, 4 billion people, have no social protection whatsoever. And another 26% of the world's population has only partial social protection with many gaps um, in the, the life cycle protection from economic security that normally uh, people should have a right to. And let us um, recall that this is um, a human right uh, that people should be guaranteed. This is a pledge made in 2012 with recommendation 202 on, on national social protection floors. And therefore it is high time now that we, that we deliver on these promises. So the timeline is, um, a relatively short one, a relatively ambitious one, but all the reactions I received uh, to uh, the report and uh, before that to the proposals I, I discussed in the consultations I led make me actually um, quite positive. I think the, the crisis we've seen has really acted as a wake-up call, um, allowing governments to identify the weaknesses in the social protection systems they have the gaps that still exist, and, um, and this has now become a, a global um, political um, uh, urgency. And I, and I, I welcome this development. I, I think um, we should not be taken off guard uh, when the next crisis uh, uh, develops. Thank you. We have another question from Peter Kenny. Thanks, yeah, I, I, um, I'm just wondering if, uh, if could we say that uh, the International Labour Conference has been the facilitator for this iteration of your plan or of the plan? Thank you. Uh, 
I think we can say this. There are essentially three tracks that have been pursued in my consultations to date. The first one is the Human Rights Council, of course. Um, it is to the Human Rights Council and the 47 member governments that I'm addressing my, my report and proposals. And I, I understand from the reactions I had yesterday that there is very strong support behind these proposals, although, of course, uh, certain points uh, uh, required uh, to be clarified. The second track is the G7 and G20 um, um, governments. I think having their support is not vital, um, but it is. It, it, it would be very important to, to strengthen further the, the mandate uh, that is now being given to the ILO. And, and thirdly, there is the International Labour Conference that you rightly mentioned. And, and that is where um, uh, most recently um, the Global Fund for Social Protection proposal has been endorsed, um, which I think is a huge victory. Um, um, now we have to ensure that we don't develop these tracks in parallel and that instead these efforts converge. Uh, but I trust uh, uh, that uh, given the quality of my dialogue with the ILO, uh, we will move along the same, the same lines and, um, and we are guided by the requirements of human rights and um, the very clear prescriptions of recommendation 202 on social protection floors uh, that recommends a rights-based approach to social protection. So I don't anticipate major um, difficulties in um, aligning ourselves um, um, with the ILO. Thank you.